Welcome to the uh, Rotowire edition of the Google uh, Fantasy Football Community. I'm here on Christmas. I'm here with Jeff Erickson and Mike Dotson to answer some of your questions. Uh, we're also going to talk some general strategy and uh, particularly about the uh, Yahoo Friends and Family draft draft that you and I just did. Um, you know, my draft is boring. I think your draft is boring too. You pick first, Adrian Peterson. No thought to shock in the world and going in another direction, Jeff? No, I mean, yeah, first, I mean pick first pick is what it is, is, what it is. but, uh, you know, it, it's, for me, the tricky part was actually the second and third pick. You know, I was wondering if I was going to take a wide receiver or not early on, and I just didn't. I uh, thought that uh, with this format, with the two plus spots, with only two receivers, that it was something that uh, was going to work out pretty well. Yeah, sorry, I'm just, I'm just taking these, getting these headphones on because I'm getting some feedback, but... Uh, yeah, yeah, I thought my, I thought my draft, draft was kind of kind efficient, efficient and competent, competent in a really boring way. I just, you know, you know took two running, running backs, backs, Doug Martin and Mar Miller, then uh, eventually uh, Roddy White and, and uh, uh, Paul Smith's 14-team league. league. So it's so kind, kind of by the book. book. I want to get I'm more gonna into gonna that, that in a little uh, bit. Uh, Mike, Mike, you've been moderating some of the reader questions. What, what do people want to know? What's some people's minds? So the main thing that people are asking is there a lot of people are reacting to the first batch of preseason games that have come out, and they've really been wanting to know what how to react to some of the injuries or I mean, the, the ongoing saga as far as Jordy Nelson's potential concerns with his knee, uh, how Mike McCarthy was saying that it's something that they've had experience with before, but it's not something that they definitely have a timetable on as far as when he's going to be ready, except that they think he'll be ready for the start of the opening of the opening game. Uh, so really how to react to the news, especially after the first preseason games, that it's early, that people may be less injured than they, that they put off just because they're trying to be overly cautious, and how do you react to the news early in the preseason? What, do you take it with a grain of salt, or do you really run with it and work with it? I think it's case by case, right? And I want to pull up this draft. This just happened today, and these are very knowledgeable experts, guys from Yahoo, some RotoWire guys, Jeff and me. Um, there's also some pro football focus guys, some guys who really know football pretty well. And I want to look at some of the results. I know it's an all trial draft of eight. That was the first sort of domino to fall from, uh, obviously, today's injury where he was helped off the field. He actually walked off under his own power. The initial report was that he was carted off. But eventually, but eventually uh, it turned uh, out that he just ended up kind of getting into the car, drove off. He had a strange foot. Typically, a strain is a muscle, as opposed to a sprain, which is a ligament. But both a sprain or a strain are both a form of a tear. And so then the question is, how severe is it? Grade one is no big deal. Grade three could be season ending. So we'll hear about that. I'm not really sure. But he's just eighth. I think I would have taken him at number three. Actually, I wouldn't have, because Doug Martin's number four. Um, so uh, I think that's so how, that's how, you know, that was one of them. I want to look up Jordan Nelson. Nelson. I want to look up exactly where he went. I want to say he went in the fifth round of a 14-team league. league. And I think that's sort of a good gauge of his market value. He went in uh, pick, well, he went in pick seven of round six. That's pretty far, I thought. Yeah, so what do you guys, do you feel like that's a a sign that, you know, he's really going to be out for some time, or is it just nerves that, hey, he may be back, he may not be? Uh, is, that, is that a real barometer as far as how far he should drop in everyone's drafts? Uh, I think it's a, a rough barometer of how far he's going to fall. I think, you know, it's a 14-team league, which does two things. One is each round is a little longer and deeper. So it means, like, a sixth round and a 14 team is like a seventh round and a 12 team. But secondly, but secondly uh, people, uh, people are a little more conservative, conservative in a 14-team. Team. You know, you, you, you don't have everything on the waiver wire. It's not so easy to pick up players. So I, I kind of think, like, in a salary league, you might just gamble on Nelson around 4 or 5 for the upside. But in a 14-team league, you got to be a little conservative. So we slip a little bit. But I think that's going to be his ADP around round 5. Could be ready for week 1. We don't know what capacity. We don't necessarily that he will be. But if he is, he's Aaron Rodgers, arguably the number one receiver. Certainly the top downfield threat and red zone threat. And then another question that people were having is, just in case Jordy Nelson is out, who do you draft instead to fill his role? Is it more, is it James Jones, or is it more just, you know, whoever whoever the reports come out as that Rodgers is most comfortable with? You know, there's a lot of people that are pretty high on James Jones to begin with. I know uh, Derek's one of those, and we've talked about that before. He believes that skill set in the uh, red zone is actually good, so it's kind of interesting to see what he thinks out of that, but that's one option. Sure, sure. 
Yeah, Cobb, yeah, I don't think he's going to be that effective. Cobb's going to get some handoffs, he's going to get some, handoffs, some short, short throws. throws. I don't think I don't he and Jordy Nelson fight, fight for too many targets. targets. You know, Rogers so throws to who's open. And Jones and, and Nelson and have, have a pretty have similar role. role. So I do so think I do Jones is the guy who's going to benefit most if Nelson should miss any time. Yeah, and uh, and just just rounding up all the um, the injuries. So we we start we started to talk about Jamal Charles. Do you, as someone who's been very high on him, Chris, do you feel that he's really going to drop uh, further down, or is it just not a big deal thing for you? Because I know you're very high on him still. Yeah, you're talking about Jamal Charles. I I think that he went eight right now, and it's kind of a bold pick. I probably would not have taken him eight. I mean, who knows? He might be fine. Might be nothing. But to me, but there's to not me, there's that, that big a difference between Charles and Ray Rice, Ray Rice and, Trent and Trent Richardson. Richardson. I, like I like Charles better than those guys, but it's not by a whole lot. And so if so one guy has a foot injury, one just one disparity, I'm not messing around with it. it. You know, for me, um, um, I'm probably dropping Charles to the point of like 10, 11, 12, maybe early second, where I feel that if he is healthy, it's a big profit. Now, 24 hours from now, we may know a lot more. But right now, right now, I, I think with your first round pick, you want to be pretty cautious. cautious. But I do I love do Charles this year. This year. I love the Chiefs system. system. Um, um, Andy Reid has gotten a lot, lot out of all his quarterbacks, and he definitely, and he definitely gets, gets a lot of mileage out of the pass catching, catching running backs. You look at the Sean McCoy and Brian Westbrook. Excellent, excellent. And then just uh, I'm looking at I'm looking at the friends and family draft now, and so one of the things that stood out to me is that Stephen Ridley has fallen back into uh, you know he's actually he. Some people think he's fallen back if he's drafted. It looks like he's 18 overall. Some people have him at the 20 range. Stephen Ridley, especially with all the, uh, you know, the fact that uh, the red, the Patriots, despite the fact that Tom Brady throws the ball out, they also run the ball a lot, especially in the red zone. And a lot of people are worried that Stephen Ridley is going to lose carries in the red zone or that he's not going to be as valuable as some people think he is. So you see in the friends and family he's going uh, 15, 17 overall. So is that somewhere where you think that was too high or with the, with the, all the injuries to the wide receivers and tight ends that it's actually a little low because he might have some first-round value considering all the injuries in New England? Uh, just uh, another hot rod uh, as far as what I've been seeing at the questions on social media. You know, I'm not a huge, not a huge Ridley guy. Um, I, I like his skill. I mean, I like him as like a between-the-tackle, goal-line, power runner on a good offense. Double-digit touchdowns are probably likely – you know, maybe 1,100 yeah, yards. yards. And in a non-PPR league, probably is early, early to mid-second second round pick. Okay. But you start but talking you start PPR, PPR, and he catches, and he catches zero, zero passes. passes. I mean, not zero, not zero, zero, maybe 10. 10. And, and when you compare that to someone like Ray Ray, who catches 70, that's a difference of 60, 60 receptions. That's 10 touchdowns. So it's hard for me to take him anything before, you know, mid to late third in a PPR league. Yeah, I'm with Chris. Yeah, I'm with Chris. Uh, the fact that it's a PPR league, 0.77 points points per race per reception. I mean, that shuts me out of that. You know, I didn't really uh, have a chance to take him anyhow, but you know, I wouldn't have taken him in the second round. I'd have taken him in the second round. And then, uh, just looking at the, I posted the link in the chat here for everyone if they wanted to actually uh, look at look at uh, how the draft uh, turned out. But was there one pick, especially early? Uh, that kind of threw you guys off guard. That you guys, or was there an early run on a certain position that you guys didn't quite expect that you had to kind of alter your strategy, or did it kind of go up, you know, the way that you expected? It, it went the way I expected, um, and you know, I almost got Julio Jones in round two, which would have been just a miracle. And he went one pick before me, so I took Lamar Miller. Um, um, it kind of went the way I expected. The 14 team league, league, the quirk in this league, league is two running backs, backs two receivers, two receivers and, two and two running back, back wide receiver tight end flexes. flexes. So instead of instead having, having that third receiver, receiver that you have, have to start, start, you have two, you have two an extra flex. flex. And, so and so what happens as a result is that running backs are a little more scarce, so they went a little bit earlier, and some more receivers available a little later. But it went to a team. The only surprise was how crazily people played chicken on quarterback. Aaron Rodgers went in the fourth round. First quarterback, first quarterback taken in the fourth, fourth round. round. And they all and they went. Have, I mean, all the good quarterbacks went between rounds four and seven. seven. You know, all the top, all the top 12, 12, basically. basically. But, but, I mean, what a weird draft where, you know, a guy kind of caves in and takes Rodgers in the fourth round. Even though I'm a way on quarterback guy, I really can't fault the hit with taking Rodgers, Bruce, and Newton in the fourth round. Yeah, I thought that was huge. I thought that... The, the, just the way just that, the way running, that running, running backs were pushed push and pushed, and, push and, push and, push and, push and I, was, I had a lot to do with that, too, obviously, obviously. by going ahead and, and taking, taking uh, 
two running two backs at two and three. three. So, so start with three running backs to start, start off with there. there. You, took you took Julio, Julio and you didn't take Julio Jones. You would have taken him. Julio Jones win was like the last wide receiver that year. You ended up taking Roddy White at three three. I was wondering, had I taken not taken those two running backs, would you have taken one of those instead of Roddy White? Which running back did you take? I took Jared McFadden and Demarco Murray. No, those flat tires. No, no. You did take a couple guys that I had in mind at some point. I can't remember. Maybe maybe Newton was one of them. But uh, you know, look, I took I took Demarco Murray in that Yahoo League that I did with Shannon, that promotional league, because it got Shannon. And you know, he was fourth round. He was the only guy left. But um, uh, I'm not, not really looking, looking to take, to take those, those guys. It would be really, and I think I had two running backs already. Backs already. Um, I did I think did that, like, I could, I could uh, go receiver there. And I thought Roddy White, I don't like Roddy White, I don't like Matt Ryan. They were just, they were by, just far by far, far the highest guys on my board, but it was my turn. I'm like, man, I hate the Falcons. I hate Vanilla Ice. And I never take Roddy White because he's so boring. But I just, he was that top guy. So speaking of, so with especially with Jeff, um, so Jeff, you you took both Demarco Murray and um, and Darren McFadden. Are you starting to hold your breath now, or is it something that you just you're really confident that these two guys are actually going to come through for you with that extra flex spot? You get those three, you know, top fifteen, twenty running backs that you can start every single week. I I really thought that McFadden was a bargain. Um, I wrote him up in our. Uh, Last year's nice Farm article, and I'll post that in the group chat in a second there, a link to that. But uh, basically, he's 25 years old. I know he's had an injury, but he's not injured now at all. And you just look at all the ability he has. He's basically their top receiver uh, in a PPR league, I think, he's old. And, I, you know, I, I really just happy to get Murray was a tougher call. There was about three or four options. One of those being white, get so many targets. You know, I you could know, have gone, gone that route for sure. I think the I think format the pushed me in this direction. Because I, I, I knew I wouldn't get a good get a third running back on that four or five turn either. Also, either. Also, so, so I thought there was a better, better, better chance I could get a receiver of value. value. Seeing, Seeing that wide receivers, receivers are deeper, deeper in this pool. But as it turns out, I don't know, we'll see. I also fell prey to going ahead and getting Cam Newton. I think that was the other thing. Taking Cam Newton at the four or five turn really changed a lot of my draft. I'm going to be scrambling at wide receiver. I took some chances. Uh, I'm happy with the results. I, I, I don't mind having Tavon Austin as one of my receivers. Uh, I took another rookie later on, Cordell Patterson. We'll see about that. But, you know, never can really doubt, you know, uh, Christian Ponder passing to him. That should be really a good opportunity for me. But, yeah, no, number, um, number three I, I do think there. that uh, it'll be a chance that uh, it's worth taking. Well, I'll say something, Jeff. Uh, you saved me because, you know, I knew that run on quarterbacks was coming, and I was picking third, you were picking first. You know, it's a long way up and a long way back before you get to go again. And Tavon Austin was the only guy I really would have maybe said, screw it, I'm just going to take whoever's left. I don't care if there's no quarterbacks left. But you took Austin maybe two picks before me. And then I was like, all right, I'm free to take a quarterback. And then Hanson took Andrew Luck, who's my guy, uh, and I had to take you know Vanilla Ice, who is perfectly good value in round seven. I just don't, I don't like rooting for him. And I guarantee the first year that I actually draft him, uh, he's going to take it out on me and take revenge and, and have a big bust season. He's going to go up full on Stafford on you there, huh? Uh, I think and, so, yeah. Yeah. Well, and you know what? That's fine because, uh, you know, what you did, though, is you started the run of quarterbacks. It was like, thank God, it's about time it's happening. Um, you know, although it didn't go that long. I took Cam Newton at 5-1. And, as again, I told you beforehand on the show, really, I'm not going to – if I see sort of really good value in Cam Newton, I'm just going to take it because I just think he's so dynamic. Now, that could blow up in my face. It could be like the first four weeks Cam Newton all year instead of the last 12 weeks, but – I really like the value at that spot. It's just, you know, and I didn't like too many of the wide receivers. I got Deshaun Jackson as one of the wide receivers. I, I messed up on my cross-off cross -off list. I thought Vincent Jackson was available. I was frantically searching for him. He wasn't. <laughs> and so once that happened, I'm kind of like, all right, I'm just going to take the best player on my board, and we'll just see how it, what, what brings after that. So I'm okay with that. No, I, I love Newton there at 5-1. Are you kidding me? That's a great pick. Um, yeah. I, it's funny that this is obviously this league is for no money because you're just using the default software as your list. Like, if you go, if you go to NFFC where it's hundred grand is the grand prize, you're not just going with the software. I mean, no, no, no. What I thought, but you know what I'm saying is I'm using our, I was using our iPad app. Right? Oh, you're using our, okay. You didn't realize. And I forgot was, to mark that he was selected. Or I, I, I just missed that he was selected in the flurry of picks at one point. I was like, I yeah, I'm going to take Vincent Jackson here. I'm excited about this. Why doesn't anybody like Vincent Jackson? Oh, right. he's taking the third round. Never mind. Yeah, it was too good to be true, and then you right. ended up wasting time. No, but Newton's a t perfectly fine pick. I mean, think about it. Newton at 5-1. I only got 
uh, Ryan at 7-3. It's not like, you know, you, the problem with taking Rodgers or Breeze in these leagues is that you get, you know, Rodgers at 112 and someone gets Ryan or Andrew Luck at 7-5 and you're like, the hell, man, that's six rounds later. But if, if you're getting him two rounds later, I mean, I can't fault it. I can't fault Funston for taking uh, Aaron Rodgers in round four. I can't fault you for taking Newton in round five, even though quarterback is so deep and there's so many, especially in this league because there's only four bench spots. And I think the format of the league does matter. You know, really there's going to be tons of QBs on the waiver wire all the time. This is not a league like the NFFC where there's 10 bench spots and it starts to get thin. There's always freely available quarterbacks. Right. The other thing I did in deference to this league format was I took Roddy White over Andre Johnson. I might have taken Andre Johnson, but injuries kill you in this league. You just don't have room. When you have bye weeks coming up, you just don't have the bench space. So What do you think about like, me Roddy taking White's a rock? Speaking of bench space, we talked about this on the show. What do you think about me taking Justin Blackman late in the draft? I took him... What did I take him really late, actually? Yeah. I thought it was like uh, 10th round, 11th round, maybe even later than that. Uh, I took him I took him at 10-14, Cordell Patterson at 11-1. Right. Cordell, I think. But, but, but Cord yeah, just, whatever. I'll get it right when no, it matters. Because what happens is when people turn in the thing with the name spelled wrong, it's a pain to correct on the spreadsheet. This is the problem we're going to have tonight with the top 200. But uh, here's the thing. Uh, I actually have no, uh, I have no problem with taking Blackman. I was going to take him. Rape, rape, you know, you snagged him for me two picks ahead of me, uh, but I don't think you're going to be able to keep him. I would have had a chance. He's got four games that he's suspended, and with this tiny bench, um, you better have no injuries, otherwise you're going to drop him. And there's no big deal about dropping him because you got him in the 10th, 11th round. Who cares? You know, he's just a guy to drop. But you're almost certainly going to drop him, given how injury-prone your team is. Whereas my team is a little more durable, so I had a chance to be able to hold on to him. Yeah, you're just so arrogant about that. That's what hilarious. do you mean? You have, you, have, you have Darren McFadden, DeMarco Murray... What do you mean? I'm not arrogant about it. I'm telling you, you have Run, running backs by their very nature are injury prone. They're not. Okay. They're not injured right now. Neither of them are injured right okay. now. So let's make a little side bet here, okay? I'll take uh, you know Doug Martin and you take Darren McFadden and we'll just bet who plays more games. Why would you get? Why do you get a first rounder and I get 23 picks later, 26 well, picks later? The fact that one's a first rounder is not because of. It's it's not because you know he's going to produce more. Probably. No, no. Com better... Who's your second running back? Let's compare oh, it to your second running. Lamar back. Lamar Miller, who's already had some injuries, had some injuries last but, year. Who's but, your third running back? Uh, Ahmad Bradshaw. Okay. <laughs> yeah, he gets hurt a lot, but he's my third running back. I mean, come on. And, and these are my second and third running backs too. I have Peterson. All oh, right, that's true. That's true. That's true. Maybe that's not so bad. But what I'm just saying is that they're not all created equal. I mean, you know, I agree with your point about McFadden's healthy now. He's 25 years old. He's got tons of skills. Uh, but, I mean, we said that last year, you know, and of course he got hurt. Yeah, I know. I know. It, but I also think that he would have gone higher than 28 overall last year. He did. He went in the first round in some cases. Right. right. I mean, yeah. I mean, he. you definitely got the proper discount. The other problem is he was bad last year. They tried to put him in some sort of zone block, zone blocking scheme, and that's not his style. He's just kind of a straight ahead, you know. I, I don't know right. about you know the X's and O's of run blocking, but there's certain guys like an Alfred Morris or an Aaron Foster who's suited to that scheme, and McFadden apparently is not. So they're shifting it back to his strength, which should be good. But I mean, I, I don't see how you could say that they're that all running backs are created equal health wise. They're not created equal, but I'm also saying that the prone label is also overused. In, in many cases, but, I mean, if anyone ever earned it, you know. It's, he's in his fourth year in the league. I mean, I don't know. I mean, it's just. Fifth year, right? He's 25, so yeah, whatever. Um, anyway, he's got injured every year. I mean, it's, it's not like it's only, you know, I understand, like, Stafford missed significant time his first two years, and now he hasn't missed a game since. So is he injury prone or was he unlucky? But McFadden, I mean, you know, I don't know. I, I think he's. He's, he's one of the, you know, if, if he's just unlucky, then there's no such thing as injury prone. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. Okay, fair enough. Uh, there are some interesting other picks in this draft. Not really, there were individual picks. Not the trends itself, so surprised me, some of the individual picks. Uh, first round of the draft, look at the turn, the, four, the 114 to one Steven Jackson, Frank Gore. That's higher than we've seen him go really anywhere. I mean, yeah, that is, you know... Brad Evans quipped, you know, great backfield for 2005. Right. Um, and, you know, I didn't know that career carries was a, was a category in this league. I mean, Steven Jackson, 2,400 career carries. Frank Gore, I don't know the exact number, but it's got to be around 2,000. And, you know, these guys are not going to be good two years from now. They may not be good next year. I mean, when this, this cliff is coming, and 
you know, it's the New England Patriots philosophy. Let's get rid of the guy a year too early rather than a year too late. Um, I would be shocked if both of those guys hold up. You know, I think probably, you know, the odds are that one of them will hold up. Uh, but then again, Gore's going to have a lighter workload. He doesn't need to get 300 carries. He's going to get 220. Um, and the line is good, and they've managed his workload lately, and he was healthy last year. So I don't know. That, I agree. That seems a bit early, especially because Gore didn't catch any passes the last year or two. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, we can make a pro- we could probably make a case for both. I mean, San Francisco, maybe, they're, they're, you know, full season with Kaepernick at quarterback, Gore is going to see these wide-open truck lanes right. to run through. Uh, and maybe because uh, he's got those wire lanes, he won't get hit as hard. I don't know. Something like that. Uh, Steven Jackson getting get all those touchdown uh, runs with the uh, Falcons. But we even saw in this league Michael Turner with a 10-touchdown season not have that good of a year. So, yeah, and I'm totally stealing Andy Barron's point, by the way. Was it your point or Andy Barron's point in the show today when we talked about Steven Jackson? What about it? That you can have a bad year in this format even when you score 10 touchdowns. Yeah, it was Barron's. He said, well, he said it's hard to have a bad year when you score 10 touchdowns, and he said, but then again, Michael Turner did. Right. Um, yeah, I, you know, but we were talking about Aaron Foster there, and Aaron Foster is like a lock to score double-digit touchdowns if he even plays like 14 games. Um, and I, I wasn't saying Foster would have a terrible year, but I just that I preferred Doug Martin, C.J. Spiller to him. Um, so what do you think about, is Doug Martin the no-brainer at three, or should I have still taken Spiller? I thought I was getting Spiller because Hanson loves Doug Martin, and the only reason he didn't get him was because uh, – was because he got like locked out and his buddy, you know, uh, Joe Dolan had to pick for him and took Foster. Well, yeah, actually, it auto picked to Foster. Uh, auto picks. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then he came back and he came back like two picks after that. No, I would have taken Martin your spot too. I, I you know, I thought I was gonna say you kind of got a windfall there, unless you just feel strongly that strongly about Spiller. Take who you want. I mean, either way, you really you're getting the guy you want. Yeah. No, I, I Martin is actually our number one on the site in PPR, even over Peterson. Now. The .75 PPR, I haven't worked out. The number is probably closer. Uh, but I don't even know why. It's .75. I don't know what the point of that is. Um, but whatever, that's the rules. you got to adapt to the rules. And uh, so uh, I I still think Martin is just – the thing I really like about Martin, he's – Looks like we had a little freeze there with uh, Chris Liss. We'll uh, get him back in here in a second. But uh, – um, Michael, I think you're back on board with us now. Um, yes, can you can you hear me okay? I can hear only one of you. I like it. Yeah, actually, perfect. you were fine. Uh, it was actually when we were talking, and you, when you were talking, there was only one of you, but when we were talking, there was an echo, and so I think we got that all ironed out. Who's a uh, Pro Bowl level guy. So, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I, I feel pretty good about, uh, about Martin. I don't really think there's a lot of fleas with him. Yeah, I agree with you on that. I definitely agree with you on that. Um, Michael, what your thoughts here? Mike, uh, Doug, Chris, uh, Chris had the choice between. But overall, the growth comes in running back, especially from year one to year two. And going into year two, you can definitely see Doug Martin taking the next step. Uh, I like what Tampa Bay is doing as far as featuring him all the time. They do have another piece there in Vincent Jackson who's been and Mike Williams too, especially in the red zone, that have shown that they are competent so that they, they don't just load up eight, nine, ten guys in the box. So Doug Martin is the guy that I would take. Furthermore, C.J. Spiller, those smaller, faster guys, uh, and especially, especially small in terms of bulk, uh, I just see many more possibilities for injury and just for an injury concern with C.J. Spiller. Uh, a, a furthermore, Buffalo is going to be down in a lot of games, and they're going to be down early. So they're going to need to count on him uh, it, more maybe in receiving in PPR leagues. Uh, so if it's a non-PPR league, I surely go uh, Doug Martin over C.J. Spiller. And even in PPR leagues, I think the edge is not as big, but it's certainly there, and I would certainly feel more comfortable drafting Doug Martin first. All right. So you're validating, Chris. There you go. I'll, well, I'll say I'll say something about though the the idea that the smaller backs get hurt more. I'm not sure that's true. Uh, certainly, in the NFL they seem to think that they seem to baby smaller backs. Tiki Barber didn't get a full load of carries until about his fourth or fifth year in the league. You know, Warwick Dunn was considered sort of a change of pace guy for a long time. Maurice Jones Drew was splitting carries for a couple of years with Fred Taylor. The smaller guys, they don't get. You know, Ray Rice wasn't even getting full time carries. Willis McGay, he was splitting carries with him for a few years. But in the end, it's Maurice Jones-Drew and Ray Rice and these guys that, you know, end up being durable. I know Maurice Jones-Drew got hurt last year, but for the most part, he's been pretty durable. And then you have 
guys like Emmett Smith and Curtis Martin, who were 5'10", 205 pounds, you know, among the lead, all-time leaders in carries. Barry Sanders was small. Um, and I think these kind of short, compact guys sometimes hold up better. And same with Chris Johnson. has been He's kind of skinnier, taller and skinnier, but, you know, he's held up really well. Um, I think a lot of it is the guys with the more violent, bruising styles. Uh, you know, it's it looks good, you know, in the short term, but it, it, they really take a beating. And a lot of those guys... They go down. And I remember Brandon Jacobs. Not only did he do that, but he had so much upper body muscle and, and weight on his, you know, on his legs that, you know, he's carrying so much more weight. So when he gets hit, when he plants and gets hit, you know, it's also carrying an extra 40 or 50 pounds that these other guys aren't carrying. So um, I don't know. I, I don't. I think sometimes the small guys are safer. Now Spiller hasn't been known for his durability. He's been nicked up a bit. So you know, he may be a question mark. But I kind of think, you know, I don't know. I'm a little nervous about Spiller too. But I, I think. Just that he's small is not in itself a, a concern. Yeah, I'm not saying that there's going to be a gulf of you know 20 picks between the two. It, no, no matter what, if you get either one of them, you should feel pretty happy. But if I was given the choice between the two, especially if it's a non-PPR, I'd be much more comfortable going with uh, Doug Martin. But if it's a PPR, you should feel pretty happy getting either. But I'm still given the preference. I'm going to go with Doug Martin. In fact, there. I mean, I have to kind of weigh you know, how much of a jump between year one and year two uh, that Martin's going to take and compare him to possibly if Adrian Peterson slips down a little bit, that difference between one and two. So they, 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 those are two guys where if I got either one of them, I feel like I got one of the top two guys in the draft. So I'm pretty high on Doug Martin. So it, it, it's, it, it's more that I really like Doug Martin more than I don't like C.J. Spiller. I think both are good. But given the choice, I'm still going to go Doug Martin every time. Okay, very good. Uh, Jordy Nelson slipped in this draft a little bit, Chris. Uh, I, I looked at uh, – I was hoping I was going to get him, actually, at, at one point because I was wide receiver four. I think he, he fell all the way into the sixth round. like halfway, Yeah, Andy Barron's got him at 6.7. Uh, was this a guy that you would, would have taken in this round as well? Did you think this was a good value? Yes. Had he come back to me, I would definitely have taken Jordy Nelson there. You know, as I said, we don't know that he's going to miss any time at all. Um, there is a chance that this is just – He's, you know, we had Greg Ambrosius on today on the XM show, and Greg's a little worried that, you know, maybe he's just kind of injury prone. You know, he got hurt last year. He'd been hurt before. He had one huge year um, in 2011, but, you know, can we count on this guy to stay healthy? Uh, we know he's good when he is healthy, but maybe this, you know, this is sort of an old injury that they cleaned up. Maybe he feels better. Uh, and round six, I think you just got to take the chance. This could be Aaron Rodgers' number one guy, and he gets red zone looks. He gets downfield looks, which means he's a guy who scores a lot of touchdowns per target. And they don't have Greg Jennings anymore. Um, James Jones, in my mind, is, is not a first-tier talent. So um, I think Nelson would be sort of the number one outside guy with Randall Cobb getting a lot of the short stuff. Yeah, and just uh, going to you know the Rotowire player projection page, and just in case if anyone's interested, uh, we do have some free trials going on. Please go to rotowire.com slash G+. That's rotowire.com slash the letter G and then the word plus. And then you can pick up a 10-day uh, free trial, take a look at our player projections, our rankings, everything we have to offer. You can head on over. And we have Jordy Nelson right now as a 70 receptions, 110 targets guy for a little over 1,000 yards and 8 touchdowns. If you get that in round 6, or round, uh, I think it was round 6, in a 14-team league, that's pretty good. I don't care what the name behind it is. If that's the value that you're getting, that's pretty good in round 6. It's very good. And uh, just one thing, Mike, and I'm glad you brought it up. The, uh, it's rotowire.com slash G-P-L-U-S. <laughs> you said to spell it out, but I, 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 I'm an idiot enough that I would, if I heard this, like type in the plus symbol and be like, <laughs> why am I not getting my trial? You know? <laughs> so, uh, rotowire.com, I just need things spelled that super simple, G-P-L-U-S. <laughs> um, and uh, so, uh, yeah, I, I agree. I mean, if you just put in the number, and that's maybe a good way to look at it. I will say, though, that those numbers are sort of optimistic, and I, I'll tell you why we do this. It may, you know... I give everybody sort of their reasonably healthy season, and for Jordy Nelson, that's his 14-game season. I dock him a game or two for the injury. But I, you know, I assume everything goes okay beyond that. Um, and I do that because beyond the existing sort of one-game injury that he has or zero-game injury, it's very hard to predict who's going to get hurt, besides like McFadden, who you downgrade just generally. Um, and uh, sorry, Jeff, I don't mean to <laughs> except, twist the Except if you're Jeff Erickson. Keep talking, yeah. keep talking, it's all good. Okay, so... 
you know, so pretty much everybody gets their full healthy season for the most part. Hakeem Nix gets docked. You know, there's a couple guys get docked a little bit, but for the most part, it's optimistic, right? Uh, and we know in the reality it's going to be a bloodbath, right? And we know in reality, like, half these guys are going to get hurt, miss time, some of them a lot of time. But I don't project that in, and I know some other sites do, so it's like the league leader has 10 touchdowns. Why? Because everybody gets docked 20% because they could all get hurt. That's no fun. We know the league leader is going to get, in running backs, going to get 14, 15 touchdowns, maybe more. We know for receivers it's going to be 12, 13, pretty much. So I make those projections as if they're healthy, and I said, you know, if they get hurt, they get hurt. We're not, you don't need us to tell you, you know, we're not a crystal ball. We're not going to tell you who's going to get hurt and who's not. What we are is, assuming everything goes as planned, here's what these guys should get. You know, so that optimistic, that, that Nelson projection I believe in if he stays healthy the rest of the year after missing a game or two uh, or being slow for a game or two, but it's, it's also optimistic. So it's, I would even say it's on the, you know, rosier side. Fair well, uh, yeah, so it, let's say, you know, even if you cut it down, you know, even 10% from where you are now, if you get a little over 60 receptions and you get a little under 1,000 yards and you get, you know, six, seven touchdowns, still in round six of a 14-team league, that is still pretty good and, and 100 targets. Uh, and, and you can't really complain much with that. Right, and that's and that would be his sort of mean projection. You know what I mean? That's not what you're... You might get quite a bit better than that or quite a bit worse, but that's his mean projection. So, um, you know, as you get to round six and seven, um, a guy like Nelson who, you know, could be hurt and get worse but could also do quite a bit better, you know, you start looking for, a lot, you know, whoever has the most upside. Very good. Hey, uh, you know, the, there was a receiver run that I missed out on the sixth, and, uh, sixth round right before you, you, you took Josh Gordon in that round, which was a killer for me. There was Nelson in that round. There's a few others, and I, I ended up with Tavon Austin as like the last guy I wanted in that group. T.Y. Hilton went, C.B. Johnson went. You know, this was a rough round for me, actually. I was a little disappointed in this one. Cecil Shorts was another one. Michael Floyd went earlier than all those guys. It, it was certainly uh, some interesting names going by there. I don't see the Michael Floyd pick. I, I don't. I mean, Mike, tell me what you think, but you got Larry Fitzgerald. It's going to be a, a, a target-dominant receiver. You've got a quarterback that may resurrect himself there or may not. The offensive line is still a work in progress. Is there really, Andre Roberts is going to get 80 targets probably at a minimum. Uh, is there room for Michael Floyd? Uh, I'll put it this way. I'd rather have Rob Hausler than Michael Floyd. So uh, especially with Jeff King getting a little nicked up, the other tight end. So I would much rather have Rob Hausler because Carson Palmer okay. also tends to like his tight ends too. Uh, and we'll see. Uh, obviously, we'll see. But uh, I'm not a big believer in Floyd. I was b big on him last year. Drafted him in almost every league. Got burned, and maybe I'm a little bitter. But you know, Michael Floyd. It could be you know he needed a year to progress into the NFL. But like I said, I'm taking Rob Hausler first. Maybe I should add Michael fault? Floyd to my last year's Bums article under the That Guy Killed Me last year plan. Absolutely. I, I, don't, feel, I don't feel comfortable. I mean, I, mean, I mean, Jeff, I'm sorry, but I, you know, he's, he's in the DeMarco Murray or the you know, Darren McFadden. He's in my other people's problems list. So if someone else wants to take Michael Floyd Bring on, please, please go See, ahead. And actually, you know what? He was in the article. He was in the article, and so was uh, – yeah. So, so was uh, McFadden, so bring it on. It's all good. Well, well, no, I mean, I, I, hey, these I guys come at a discount for a reason. But Michael Floyd didn't. The other guys did. Or McFadden went at you know, market value. Murray went at a slight discount to you, I think. Uh, but Floyd, you didn't take him, but he went early. He went ahead of oh, yeah, all these other was, guys. That wasn't value. That was reach up. and That was, that was bought betting on the come. Was that Brad Evans? No, it was uh, from a site that we don't like to mention. Okay. So here's – I mean – I think Michael Floyd, it wasn't his fault. It was Ken Wisenpunt's fault, right? Because mm -hmm, Ken, right. Ken Wisenpunt, uh, he, every time you know, they could punt, they did. And not only did he just do a horrendous job uh, coaching the team, he pretty much announced after they drafted Floyd 13 overall that Andre Roberts was the starter and Floyd was like buried. He pretty much just announced that and followed through on it. And then the last day of the year, Floyd had a big game against the Niners, although most of his production was on a Hail Mary that was tipped. Um, so, you know, that doesn't really count. But I don't have a knock against Floyd. I think he could be a good NFL receiver. I just don't see how, you know, they're going to have enough targets. Unless Larry Fitzgerald gets hurt, I just don't think, see how there's enough targets to go around. 
So just to put, to put some perspective on the whole entire discussion, wide receivers that were drafted after Michael Floyd in this draft, right, uh, right, the next pick right after him, Cecil Shorts, who's probably going to get more targets, Jordy Nelson, who we just discussed, uh, T.Y. Hilton was after him, Tavon Austin, then you head to the next round, and you get guys like Golden Tate, Anquan Bolden, and then a guy who I love, especially in P uh, PPR formats, is Lance Moore, who now gets the head coach that loves to utilize guys like Lance Moore back in Sean Payton. Uh, Drew Brees loves Lance Moore and, uh, and will target him a lot this year. Uh, you, and those are guys who I feel almost all of them would be much more comfortable for me. And then also a guy like Stevie Johnson, who I, can, I value so sometimes even in some formats, a low number two. Uh, wide receiver, and I don't consider Michael Floyd anywhere in a in a number two wide receiver role. Uh, am I crazy there, or do you guys feel like Michael Floyd at best is a wide receiver three? I mean, you know, there's upside if, if something happens to Fitzgerald. If if, they're, if Fitzgerald's healthy and gets 160 targets, and then Hausler gets 85, and and Andre Roberts gets 85, and various fourth receivers and running backs get a bunch, I, I just don't see the room for Floyd to get enough targets to be good. So I agree with you. I also like Stevie Johnson. He's about 6'2", 205, 210, uh, and he's pretty quick. And uh, he's been playing with some subpar quarterbacking most of his career. They just got a now a new offensive-minded, up-tempo coach. They're going to call more plays. They're going to move the ball quicker. And they've got a, a quarterback, if, it's, if E.J. Manuel does win the job, it looks like he will, that could be a lot better than Ryan Fitzpatrick. And so uh, I think there's some upside for Stevie Johnson. I'll go one step farther. I, I'm not even a big fan of the Arizona, the renaissance of the Arizona offense. I don't believe in Carson Palmer. We've discussed this before. You know, keen master of the uh, soul-killing pick six that he is. Right. Uh, I I just don't see one exhibition game against the Packers against not entirely their strong uh, strongest defense, a defense that isn't that good to begin with, or at least wasn't last year. You know, I'm not I'm not really buying that. This is all going to be a a great offense. It'll be better than last year, but you still have six games against the NFC West, two games against Seattle, two games against San Francisco, two against St. Louis. None of those are layups. Um, I, I think that there's still going to be a mediocre offense. I like all those wide receivers better than Floyd. Maybe Lance Moore and Floyd are on the same pain, plane, but even then, I think I'd take Lance Moore before him. So, you know, each their own. Some people like to, uh, you know, grab their guy thinking they're not going to get him. If that's the case, there's one other person that liked Floyd enough that would have taken him before it would have come back to him. Well, I guess you can make the justification for it. I just don't see it myself. Per, uh, yeah, I can't. I can't in any way, shape, or form see Michael Floyd being a round four guy. Unless it's a 32-team league, I just don't see Michael Floyd as a. If you put enough teams in. It, if you put enough yeah. teams in, anybody can be a fourth round pick. Exactly, but that, that's kind of the way. That, I can't stress this enough. Michael Floyd is not a number two wide receiver at current time. If Larry Fitz, even if Larry Fitzgerald goes down, I'm still not sure that you know I would be drafting Michael Floyd very highly. I mean, there's a reason why he's not the clear cut number two now, uh, and and that why he's not being featured right now. And it's and I just don't feel comfortable doing that. I would much rather get the guys that were drafted after him, especially guys like Cecil Shorts, who I know is going to get targets, whether or not. And they're going to be throwing a lot because they're going to be losing, the, the, uh, the Jaguars are. So you, you're going to get a lot of targets that way. You're going to get long touchdowns possibly. Anything, that, many more things that could be better than drafting Michael Floyd. Yeah, and that's even with uh, Chad Henney, uh, the, who is the new Steve Berline, or uh, Blaine Gabbard as the quarterback. They're still, I think, better targets. And you really have to dig deeper to get worse than uh, the Jacksonville quarterbacks last year. But uh, Arizona was actually it. Considerably thing. worse. Ari yeah. Arizona made Jacksonville look like the 49ers when it was young and Montana switching off. I mean, <laughs> Arizona, Larry Fitzgerald had 100 and I want to say 164 targets, something like 154 targets, and he averaged 5.1 yards per target. That was less than what C.J. Spiller averaged or Adrian Peterson or Jamal Charles averaged carrying the ball. Now, that's per target. I mean, you know, receivers – need to average, an average receiver gets about, well, there's a difference between possession receivers and downfield receivers, but the average receiver gets about seven and a half to eight yards per target. When you're at five, I mean, you are you are a liability. I mean, when they called Larry Fitzgerald's number last year, it was a disaster. Anybody with 150 targets, even 100 targets, I've never seen them much under six. 5.1 at 154 targets might have been the most inefficient receiving season in NFL history. 
for Larry Fitzgerald last year. That's how bad. The, and Larry Fitzgerald is basically a Hall of Famer in his late prime. So that's how bad the Arizona quarterbacking is. And yeah, and Arizona is just not a place where I'm expecting a ton of fantasy points outside of Larry Fitzgerald. We talked about it a little bit last week. You know, if, are there teams that are black holes for fantasy points? Uh, someone I saw that all three of the running backs for for Arizona were drafted in the middle of the draft, which means none of them are very good. But it also means that there's not going to be that many fantasy points unless people get injured. Uh, am I going to take that risk today? No, it's a little too early. I'd rather let someone else do that, and I'll try to take more guarantees because there aren't as many. I mean, the injury reports are still a little short. But until someone gets injured, I'm not going to, you know, quote unquote, stoop down to the Arizona Cardinals offense for my source of fantasy points. I'd much rather try to even grab a guy on New England right now who's not necessarily proven. Uh, maybe an Aaron Dobson before I try to go after someone on Arizona. Just I'm not comfortable drafting an Arizona Cardinal in that offense. Uh, it's, you can't afford to be a snob, though, Mike. You, you can't. You can't. <laughs> you can't treat teams like they're beneath you, because a there's uncertainty. I remember the Cleveland Browns in 2007. Nobody thought they were anything, and then Braylon Edwards had 16 touchdowns, and Kellen Winslow had a thousand yards as a tight end, and Derek Anderson threw for 29 touchdowns in like 14 games. You know, and there's going to be somebody else. It was the Panthers in 2011. You know, it was a wasteland. I mean, even they had Steve Smith, but they were like, who's going to throw in the ball? Cam Newton's a run-first quarterback. They thought he was Vince Young. And he comes out, and he, you know, and he ends up being a good passing quarterback, too, and Steve Smith has a good year. Um, you know, I don't know. You know, the Jets look like the biggest wasteland of the, in the entire league. If San Antonio Holmes out four games at least. Who knows if he's ever coming back. Stephen Hill... Basically, this guy's just like an athlete. They pulled into to a football field that no one knows if he actually can play football. Uh, but, you know, maybe Geno Smith is good, and maybe he's good right away. And, you know, maybe Chad Henney keeps playing well, and Justin Blackman comes back, and they've got two good receivers, and, and Maurice Jones-Drew's healthy. And maybe Arizona clicks. Um, I just think the point is you don't want to – it's just you, you need to be able to envision it. You need to start envisioning possibilities. And when you get to, like, the third receiver on one of those teams, it's tough. But – especially when there's an established number one. I could see anybody on the Jets, anybody on the Jets doing well, because there's nobody established. It's wide open. It's tougher in a, in a team like Arizona where you have such an established guy like Fitzgerald. I was actually disappointed when I didn't get Stephen Hill in the, th in the last round of the draft. Uh, I really thought that... Uh, <laughs> no, seriously, because I think there is a lot of upside with him. A former first-round pick. He had that one big signature game in the first game of the year last year, got hurt. You know, yeah... Is it gonna? Are they gonna find a quarterback that can deliver the ball to him? That's debatable, but I mean, the talent at least is there. Right. They said that about Demarius Thomas too. Just an athlete who couldn't catch, right? Right. And then Peyton Manning came along, and suddenly he's like one of the best receivers in the league. So it could happen with Stephen Hill. Yeah. Peyton but, Manning's not walking in that door. Is the only no, difference. no, he's <laughs> not. But if Geno Smith is Russell Wilson, you know. I mean, that's not that far fetched that he becomes Russell Wilson or Kaepernick or one of those kind of guys. Exactly. Yeah, but I mean. I get uh, the point underneath. What I guess I'm trying to say is, I'm I don't want to be the guy who's gonna try. I I, I it's kind of almost like re reinventing the wheel. I don't want to try to be. I I know there's a very limited percentage that you have to win your leagues, but am I gonna be the one that's bold enough to say, yes, Arizona Cardinals, they are the team that's going to be that no one talks about. And we are going to, I'm going to go heavy on Arizona, uh, not heavy on Arizona Cardinals, but I'm going to draft an Arizona Cardinal early because I know that offense is going to click. No, so I guess not. Be, yeah. But at the same time, I mean, do you want to take the number four receiver on a good offense or the clear number one on a bad offense? I mean, that, that's the choice you're really making here. That, you know, you're taking a chance on, do you want to have, uh, let's, I'm trying to, you know, well, Nick you Toon have... or Stephen Hill? You know, that's basically what you're looking at. Yeah, I mean, of course, and with and with your with the Yahoo friends and family, uh, the fr uh, the fr the friends league that everyone's in, uh, there there's other options that I might think about, especially with the second flex, uh, a guy who was drafted actually a little earlier than I thought was in round twelve uh, to someone that we don't really talk about much, but <laughs> um, Zach Zach Sudfeld from New England. You know he's he's running with the first team now, and he may be that guy that kind of fills in for Gronk when Gronk is not there. So, uh, and with a second flex spot, that might be someone who I may put in instead of, you know, a number two or number three uh, or a number two guy on a terrible offense. It just I'd rather take that kind of a risk than 
the other kind of a risk. I'm not saying don't take any risks because you you'll never win. In a 12 team league, you have a little over 8% chance to win your league, but or in a 14 team, it's even lower than that. Probably something more like a 6% chance. So you got to take some risks somewhere. So well, am I? New England is a weird situation because it's a good offense that's wide open, right? Like, how many good offenses do we not know who the hell is going to get the ball, right? I mean, that's like a very unique situation where it's like, okay, we have Danny Amendola, Gronk, whenever it is that he comes back, could be six weeks into the season, and that's it. We know Ridley's going to get some carries. We know Vereen will probably catch some balls. But, like, for the receiving core, for a team that throws the ball 600 times with, with an all-time great quarterback, we don't know who's getting the ball. That is extremely rare. Um, it's way more common to have it like the Saints, where we know exactly who's getting the ball, or the Broncos, or you know the Packers, unless Nelson's hurt, and then all bets are off there. So New England is a weird case where you have these totally unproven guys uh, in a very good offense. That's an odd case, and and that is a, a you know it's worth gambling on Dobson or Sudfeld perhaps. Uh, but there's other cases too where you have a Denarius Moore in Oakland, or you know I took Rod Streeter because I actually think he's a little more durable and he's big and he's fast. Um, where it's a crappy offense, but you know you pretty much know who's going to get the get, going to get the looks. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's it's a matter of how good. Yeah, it, as when you're going this deep, you know. Yeah, you want to get a guy who's going to get some looks just because they'll get the you know the accounting stats of football, if you will. You know, they'll get a couple more receptions. They'll get maybe a couple more yards, but. You know, if you want to look for those true breakouts, those true upsides, for me, I'd rather try to see if there was someone on a more established offensive system. Uh, if we if we look at the Jets, I mean, the only I mean, Bilal Powell's going to get drafted in almost every league, but a guy like Zach uh, uh, Sudfeld is not, and he's not going to get drafted in every league. And that's kind of the and if you were starting a team and you were looking at those athletes. You know, which two would you rather have, or which one would you rather have? I'd much rather have the more athletic tight end at this point than a middle of the road to lower of the road running back that's just serviceable and you can hand him the ball and he may not fumble. That's pretty much, you know, and that and that's kind of what's going on now with the dearth of of, of running backs. There's just none available, so you're going to take a chance on a guy like Bilal Powell, and you won't take a chance on a guy, you know, who who may who may break out, who may not at another position like tight end or wide receiver. Running backs are like closers. You just need the job, you know. I mean, because you get the save or you get the touchdown. It's just, it's just that you need the job. Now there are some closing situations that are so bad. Remember Baltimore one year? There's nobody worth yeah. owning on it. On, but and it happens in in uh, football too. The running back situation in, in Jacksonville once Maurice Jones Drew went down, or in Oakland once McFadden went down. It was so poor there was basically no one worth owning. But I would say that's the exception, not the rule, even on bad teams. Yeah, it, it took an Arizona level uh, nuclear disaster for really to have no running backs worth anything there last year at least. But uh, yeah, you're you're absolutely right about that. Um, tight ends. Uh, I, I waited till middle rounds. I almost kind of regret taking Gates when I did. And not that I dislike him, but I almost would have rather taken another running back or wide receiver because there's still plentiful tight ends out there. Uh, how did you address the position in the draft? Uh, you stole Gates from me, actually. I was going to take two picks before. I mean, you stole some guys I didn't really care that much, and it was sort of right, like right. first you wait on QBs, then you wait on tight ends. If you, if Graham, if you don't, if you're not drafting in just that sweet spot where Jimmy Graham makes sense, where you don't have to reach for him and he's the, the best available. And to me, this this leads a little different because they're all the two flex, only two receivers. But to me, it would be normally after the six big six receivers are gone, usually mm -hmm. um, in most formats. And by the big six receivers. Just for those of you who don't know who I'm talking about, Calvin Johnson, Des Bryant, A.J. Green, Demarius Thomas, Julio Jones, and Brandon Marshall. Those are the big six. And so I'd probably take Graham after those guys are gone, after one or two of the second-tier running backs are gone. But if you're not in that sweet spot, forget it. Wait forever on tight end. Once you get past the first couple, you know, the difference between number six and number 20, I, I can't tell you. I can't tell you who's better. So I got Kobe Fleener. I really like the fact that Dwayne Allen's a little banged up. His old coach, Pep Hamilton, who was the coach of both him and – Andrew Luck at Stanford uh, is the offensive coordinator. And so um, that really bodes well, I think. And Fleener looks really good in early camp. And uh, he was hurt a lot of last year. And plus, tight ends never do anything in the rookie years. They're usually only good in their second year. And if you look at the uh, draft today, there was a, a metric ton of tight ends that went after our respective picks. Uh, just in the uh, ninth round alone, we saw after I, I went Gates, you went Fleener, then we went to Michael Finley. At uh, Owen Daniels, also had Martellus Bennett, uh, you know, with the Bears, maybe that might be interesting. 
Follow that by Brandon Myers at, from, from uh, your Giants now in the 10th round. Jordan Cameron went, Rob Hausler. Uh, a lot of tight ends go. Tyler Eifert actually went in this round too. That was an interesting snag. Yeah, what's going on with him, Jeff? You know what? Uh, I, I look at uh, exactly uh, you know what, what he's getting in terms of Dalton liking him a lot in the training camp in the preseason. A.J. Green hasn't been practicing. They've been turning to him a lot. They could be doing – they're trying to emulate that New England thing with going two tight ends. He might actually get up, end up more, with more targets than Gresham. It's possible. Gresham is a good blocker. So you could see a scenario there where Gresham's on the line and Eifert's in the slot. Yeah, uh, I'm – I'm I'm inclined to both Bengals tight ends actually are very interesting to me this year how they shake out are they going to try to emulate what New England does with a lot of two tight end sets because it seems to work and it really helps the quarterback out to have two really big targets in the middle of the field that can really do something with the ball so that's something that I'm keeping my eye on as far as how that progresses through camp uh, I, I don't want to get too high on Bengals not named um, AJ Green because AJ Green's still going to dominate all those targets as he should. But uh, it, as far as when you get this deep into the draft, yeah, sure, why not take a chance on a Tyler Eifert? Though the one tight end though that did that was striking to me as far as how far he has dropped was Brandon Pettigrew from the Lions going after all those guys that you mentioned, and he was. Um, I think he was in round 13, or around 11 in that range even, and I was wondering why you guys think he's falling so far. Yeah, he was at the, the 12th pick of round 11. So why Look is at he the yards falling per target. So he ha he, he's just there. He's just a guy. I mean, yeah, he got a lot of targets before, but I don't think he has any special uh, like get-deep skills. He's not a big play guy. He loses half the uh, tight end red zone targets. It's Scheffler. Uh I mean, he's got yeah, Calvin he, Johnson on his team who's going to yeah. dominate the targets, right, and right, right. he can't catch. He just cannot catch. <laughs> I mean, you know, that's it. It's like, dude, you got to catch the ball. I mean, I can't, you know, there's not, it's just there's nothing to say about it. It's like you cannot catch. I mean, Jermichael Finley's kind of the same way. You can't drop every other ball that hits you in the hands. you got to catch almost all of them, you know. I mean, I love, you know, you play football in the park, right, Mike? I mean, yeah. You, you, if someone throws you the ball, I mean, once in a while you'll drop one, but you pretty much catch it. You know, it's just, dude, catch the damn ball. I mean, I even want someone playing on my team in the park who's not going to catch the ball. This is an NFL player. You got to catch the ball. You know. Yeah, stone hands. Yeah, he definitely has a couple of those. And you know, speaking of tight ends who just can't seem to. Yeah, it, it, speaking of Gates, uh, who you who uh, one of you guys drafted, right? I think uh, Jeff. Yeah, that was me. Him. Yeah. That so. Was me. Um, I'm actually in San Diego right now, and uh, you can't tell behind me because I had to close all the shades because all the glare cutting in. But uh, a guy who I've always liked since they drafted him uh, was with the Chargers drafting Ladarius Green, and last year he didn't do much at all. He got a little banged up, but he's a guy that could return. You know, if Gates goes down, that's a guy who I would have an eye on. You know, a little bit of a homer pick as well because I'm very Charger based. But uh, he's a guy who's always impressed as far as his athletic capability and a guy who can catch. So if Gates, if Gates, it's, not, it's, it's almost a matter of when he goes down now at this point rather than if, a guy to definitely keep your eye on because John Phillips, who's technically ahead of him on the depth chart, he's going to be a blocking guy. He's really more of a Randy McMichael type than he is an Antonio Gates. But Ladarius Green is a guy, really deep leagues, or just a guy to put, uh, you know, put the watch flag on you know, just, in, just in case Gates goes down. He's a guy who's very serviceable. Hey, Mike, I got a guy like that on the Giants, Adrian Robinson. He's the backup to Brandon <laughs> Myers. Same thing. They love him. Good athlete. You know, you think if you ever got to play, he might be good. We should do a side bet. Ladarius, Adrian <laughs> Robinson. And, but but it would have to be a floor. Like, someone has to get at least 40 catches for it to count. But I, I really yeah, I think there are dudes like that around the league. I think part of it's from New England. I, I do think that, that two tight end thing um, that they did, and maybe Cincinnati is emulating them, the fact that, you know, why is it that you would need two receivers on the field and not two big blocking guys, you know, that you can do more di different things with um, and also help block during running plays? You know, why would you need two receivers and one tight end rather than two tight ends and one receiver? Uh, you know, there's no, there's no reason it should be the case. Yeah, and if worse comes to worse, you can, split, you can split one of them out wide and create a matchup nightmare with whoever's trying to guard them. So uh, it, implementing that... Implementing that every inch of the field needs to be covered by someone who's really athletic on defense. That, that's not easy to do. So 
that kind of mentality, if those te if there's a team that's really utilizing the entire field and putting athletes everywhere and making matchups really difficult for the defense, yeah, that's something that I would look for in fantasy as well. If there's a team that's doing that, which is why Philadelphia is so intriguing, if they can stay healthy, uh, that that's. That's something that I can that, that you should take advantage of in fantasy. If there's matchup problems for the defense, those guys are going to do very well in real life and in fantasy as well. Yeah, speaking of the Eagles, what do you think about Deshaun Jackson now in that offense with uh, everybody else dropping like flies? Uh, is he going to go nuts in the Chip Kelly offense, or is this going to be another year where he gets overdrafted and people expect too much from him? He could be Randall Cobb. He could be Michael Floyd. Uh, it's really a matter of... Uh, which is, by the way, a fourth rounder in some cases. But um, if he could really be Randall Cobb, the, the opportunity is there for him to take. It's really more about him than about anything else. Everything has fallen into place for Deshaun Jackson to really break out this year. And if he doesn't, I'm not going to rate him very highly any year going forward at this point. Uh, he, he's going to have one. They like three quarterbacks. I mean, Matt Barkley has looked good. They love Nick Foles. Mike Vick is Mike Vick. Uh, there's no shortage of quarterbacks that can get him the ball in any way, shape, or form. LaShawn McCoy is there as well. Bryce Brown is obviously a threat. Brent Selleck's serviceable. But it's a matter of he needs to take over and really needs to take that vocal leadership that you used to see Terrell Owens do on the Eagles and really just you know take the bull by the horns and really take, make that job his. <laughs> he needs to call out. He needs to call out his quarterback. That's what he needs to do. Yeah, make like him throw T.O. style. Yeah, exactly. Uh, make, make him throw up. He's on my the field. quarterback. <laughs> start, start, start some drama in the locker room. No, but I will say something. Deshaun Jackson could be Randall Cobb with more speed, with the home run, yeah. with the home run in his in his. Uh, bag of tricks. I mean, the thing that Randall Cobb doesn't really do that Deshaun Jackson does is he gets behind the defense. And Vic, you know, for all his flaws as a quarterback, can't. It does have a big arm. And so if Deshaun Jackson can take handoffs, which he probably will in this offense, if he can, uh, you know, get a lot of targets, he'll also get deep, you know, he can also score touchdowns because he can, you know, score a 60-yarder. Um, the question is, can he stay healthy? And he's not the guy who's going to go up the middle. I mean, he is small. I mean, I think he weighs like 170 pounds. I mean, he's really, really small. And the other, what? Yeah. He's, so, you know, he's like a little kid out there, you know what I mean, in the NFL. So, you know, that's, that's the one issue. But he's not only fast but incredibly quick. And I hope they use him because I like Deshaun Jackson. He's a very, very exciting player. True yeah. or false, Matt Barkley does not start a game this year for the Eagles. If he does not start, false. I think he will start at least one game. Interesting. Uh I have no read on this. Let's say Vic goes. I'll say I'll say you're right. False too, because I think Vic goes down, misses a few games, and who the hell is Nick Foles? I mean, you know why? Why would you know, I know he has another year of experience. He was okay under horrible circumstances down the stretch. He was not terrible. He did his best under a terrible situation, but I mean, why wouldn't he let Barkley get a little some reps? Yeah, and here's my theory on Barkley. If everyone, if all the NFL scouts were so high on him two years ago, right. surefire number one pick. He did not. He did not forget how to play football in a year. He still. He's still very good at football. And maybe he partied too much in his senior year. Maybe there was something outside of football that kind of affected his on the field play. But if he needs the NFL to get himself focused, you know, no 20-hour practice weeks, he's there all the time, then that's what it takes. I, I think Matt Barkley has the mental makeup to really succeed in this league, and he has the arm talent to be uh, – he may not have the deep ball that Mike Vick does. You know, if Chicks dig the long ball in baseball, Chicks dig the Mike Vick long touchdown pass to Deshaun Jackson, that, will, I mean, that can certainly happen. But Matt Barkley could make him more of, let's say, a, a PPR threat. You know, he may be able to get the ball like Percy Harvin – you know, who may not play this year, but per, like a Percy Harvin type of receiver where he gets the ball a lot, whether it's on receptions or whether it's rushing the ball, if he's going to return kicks at all this year, you know, that, that's something that you can really latch onto and you can really like as a fantasy owner. But there's boom or bust here, lots of it. Yeah. Uh, I think that's a good note to end on. Um, you know, we will be back at the usual time, uh, 5 p.m. Eastern, uh, 2 p.m. Pacific uh, to do these chats every week. We're going to be posting content all week. Mike is in charge of posting a lot of stuff. He's done a good job with it. And uh, if you want to check out the entire site, we strongly recommend it. Rotowire.com slash G plus, G P L U S. Uh, you can take a free 10 day trial. Appreciate everyone listening, and uh, we'll talk to you next week.